much, Itzy. It's so good to see you, and um, and I want to thank you so much for for making the time in your day to, to help us out today. Uh, and I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone watching this, our global community, our global family. Um, we've worked really hard to put this together for you, and I think you're going to enjoy what we're going to do this next uh, 90 minutes or so. So, Chinzia, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Greg. And I want to take time to welcome everybody from around the globe that's joining us on this discussion and webinar today um, from chaos to resilience. And I believe that there is just such a need for this right now and such a calling for it. And so I wanted to acknowledge you and thank you for putting this course together. And I want to welcome everybody that is familiar with your work as well, that have been following you for, I think, almost 35 years now from around the globe. And for people that are new to your work, uh, they're in just for such a treat today. So uh, thank you so much for for being with us all. It's it's going to be a very inspiring conversation. Okay, just one, just one more. I, there is a whole team working to put this together. We have a team in South Florida. We have a team in Southern California in the San Diego area. We have a broadcast team south of Seattle, Washington. You are uh, south of the equator. I, I won't give your secret location away. And and I am uh, I'm coming from my uh, my home and studio office in the uh, in the high deserts of of northern New Mexico, just outside of, of Santa Fe. So I want our, our viewers just to know that um, it takes a whole team to put something like this together. And I just want to acknowledge everyone. So so thank you. And Chinsey, we all want to know who you are. Tell us who you are. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. So I'm a meditation teacher and a mindfulness coach and also a presenter based in, I can say that I'm in Sydney, Australia, <laughs> and it was beautiful driving over the Harbour Bridge this morning uh, to get to the studio. And so, yeah, I've been on this journey for about 12 years now and been very grateful to have travelled around the world, learning various techniques and working with incredible groups, uh, high performance mm -hmm. groups around the world and being part of scientific studies to do with meditation and mindfulness and how we can rewire the system and our brain and that's been really great so to do with regrowing telomeres the end strands of our dna and uh, gdb testing which is you know the energy systems of the body and heart math which of course you're very familiar with and so i consider myself very blessed and created the online series uncovering the sacred as well speaking to leaders in science and spirituality on the power within us that creates our reality and of course i got to interview you in london so that was that was really fantastic as well yeah <laughs> So yeah, well, yeah. we have a history together and that's why I invited you. And, and um, uh, I think you're the perfect person to, to lead us through what can be a complex conversation, but I think it will be very simple because of the way we're going to lay this out today. Yeah, most definitely. And I know that uh, today is certainly really highlighting that adaptiveness with resilience because as we know so much has shifted and changed in the world including the way that people would be able to access your information and so so much of what you do is in live uh, conferences and obviously just overnight so much of that changed and this is one silver lining that we can really look at through this pandemic. I heard you say the other day, if you're going to have a global pandemic, let it be in the time of technology. And so <laughs> because of that, now so many more people will be able to uh, reach you and hear your message. And, you know, one thing that I love about the work you do and why I'm so honoured to be a part of Team Braden is that you really do listen to people that follow you and I was reading, you know, even in your book, when you changed the title of your book, The Turning Point, it, to basically looking at techniques and resilience techniques people can actually dive into and changed it to resilience of the heart because you know that people need to get straight to the point at the moment and people want to know why we're living in these times of extremes and what they can do about it and the fact that you've now created something where people can access these techniques is really wonderful so thank you for listening 
to your audience so well as well because a lot of people have approached me saying when's Greg going to do something what's he going to do because people really do look to you for um, a grounding and wisdom so I'm excited for today really really excited well thank you for that chance you know I'm, I'm a student of, of listening I have learned over the years uh, it's there's a skill to listen rather than trying to formulate your response to what someone else is saying before they finish saying it. And uh, I'm a student uh, of that. I'm learning to become uh, an even better listener. And I do listen to my audience and that's why we're doing what we're doing today. We, we, me, my office, my organization, we have been inundated with questions about what in the world is going on in the world, what's causing what's going on in the world, what can we do about it to make our lives better? And it has led me to touch upon a body of work that I typically do not offer in, in this format. So in, in the time we have together today, I wanna to make good use of our, our time today. Um, we're going to talk a lot about what, what's happening, the triggers, what's causing our, our time of extremes, uh, what it means, what we can expect, and uh, I think perhaps most importantly, what can we do about this? And, um, and that's where I'm going to invite you to, to skillfully and masterfully guide us <laughs> through the corridors of this conversation to, to keep us on track. So thank you. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I think from our conversation the other day, I was really sitting with, we were talking about the definition of resilience and the traditional definitions of resilience and how that is really changing. And it made me think about uh, when I was in high school and I had a chemistry class and they taught us the difference between a chemical reaction and a physical reaction and with a piece of toast. And that once you've started cooking that, piece of, of bread, it becomes toast and it's not possible to change it back to the white fluffy substance that it was. And I was thinking that is for me, a really great analogy about what is going on now. It's we can't go back to what was. And so many people have been going, when's it going to go back to normal? And, uh, you know, from our conversation as well, it's like, it, it's not going back to normal. So therefore, how can we really witness accept and be present with what is happening in the world right now and then have healthy ways to be able to uh, deal with that. And so that's definitely what we're going to be stepping into today as well. Yeah, so I, I think what I'd like to do, uh, let's just talk about the extremes. Are you okay if we talk about that first? Can we can we do it that way? Absolutely, yeah. So, so what, if you have followed my work, in the past, you know that this is uh, this is almost the 36th year that I've offered this work in one form or another. And what I'll say is I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm a degreed earth scientist, a geologist. I have a strong background in, uh, in the geophysics uh, as well as in the life sciences because I was, I was an ocean science major before I became uh, a, a geologist. So marine biology to marine geology to to geology, and, and one of the things I learned, Chencia, as a scientist, is that we as scientists have been conditioned to look at what happens in the world in terms of boxes that we can be comfortable studying. So we call those boxes like chemistry and geology and biology and physics. And while it's good to study those boxes, the, the, the truth is, the reality is that nature doesn't know about those boxes. We have a world, we have life. And if we are truly going to understand and become masters of our experience, we've got to cross those traditional boundaries that have separated the sciences in the past. And in many, uh, in many respects kept us separate from understanding our, our own experience in the world. I, I know it sounds a little nebulous. Let me, I'm just gonna give a, an example. Let me just give an example of what I'm saying here. I remember in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, as a geologist, uh, I was watching the magnetic fields of the Earth go through very rapid shifts. They're continuing right now. The magnetic fields of our planet are, are shifting. And my question to my geological colleagues, I said, wow, the magnetic fields of the Earth are changing. What does that mean for us? What's it mean for humans? And they had their little geology blinders on and they said, you know, don't ask me, 
I'm a geologist. Go ask a biologist. So I asked my biology friends, I'd say, you know, the magnetic fields of the earth are changing. What does that mean? And they say, hell, we don't know. <laughs> We're biologists. We're not taught to think in terms of the effects of earth upon living systems. Now, this was in the 70s and 80s. It's changing. It's changing slowly, but it has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about today. So that's why I wanted to use that example, because we are, in fact, living uh, a time of extremes. Now, I know that's that's not new for anyone watching us. People know even the people that used to resist the fact that something is different now are asking what's going on. Everybody knows something's up. The question is, what's up? So I, as a scientist, I, I'm a systems thinker. First of all, and what that means is I tend to look at the big picture first, the big picture. I mean, I like to go out into the cosmos and and see how all these cosmic systems are working. Then I like to leave that behind and go into the nano instant of right now and what's happening in my life and your life and my community's life and how it's being influenced by what's happening in the cosmos. So. Uh, I think, what do you think, Shensi? Can we uh, maybe begin just with quickly with a big picture? Yes. You okay if we Should do it we that start? way? Is it okay? Would it be okay with you if I could introduce your background to the people that may be listening to you for the first time? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. I, I think there, there are probably some people who are very familiar with me and my work. And a lot of circles, people have no idea of what I've been doing for the last 36 years. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sure. Thank, thank you for that, Chancy. I appreciate that. That's okay. Yeah. I, would just, I would just love to take that time. So, because sure. everything that you've done is so important and that's what's brought us all in to this conversation today. So I'd love to uh, take, a, take a moment to do that. And then I'm going to ask you lots of questions about the times of extremes and, right. <laughs> and what we can do to be able to cope with that. So I'm just gonna take a moment. So for everybody at home, I would just love to formally also introduce Greg and I'm gonna read from his uh, biography word for word so that I can really honor that for him. So Greg Braden, who you can see on the screen right now, <laughs> he's a five time New York Times best selling author, scientist and pioneer, bridging science, spirituality, social policy and human potential. From 1979 to 91, Greg worked as a problem solver during times of crisis for Fortune 500 companies, including Cisco Systems, where he became the first technical operations manager in 1991. He continues problem solving today as he merges modern science and the wisdom of our past to reveal real world solutions to the issues that challenge our times. To date, his research has led to 15 film credits. And by the way, that's how I first discovered you was on the film, You Can Heal Your Life. So that's just a note in the corner. <laughs> um, where am I? I've lost my, my place. And 12 award-winning books now published in over 40 languages. That's something I do notice. As soon as you announce something, so many people from all around the world say, is it going to be in Portuguese? Is it going to be in German? Is it going to be? So you're really, really far reaching. Greg is a member of visionary organizations and think tanks, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Arlington Institute. He's presented his discoveries in over 30 countries on six continents and has been invited to speak to the United Nations, which is amazing, by the way, everybody needs to see that, that speech, Fortune 500 companies and the US military. The United Kingdom's Watkins Journal lists Greg among the top 100 of the world's most spiritually influential living people for the seventh consecutive year, congratulations. And he is a 2020 nominee for the prestigious Templeton Award established to honor outstanding individuals who have devoted their talents to expanding our vision of human purpose and ultimate reality. So thank you, Greg. I just wanted to make sure that we had passed that information on to people that were new to you today. Um, yeah, thank you're you. amazing. Thank you, Chinsy. You're one of my favorite I, I, I appreciate in the whole that. world. So. I, <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. And I especially appreciate the part from the Watkins Journal that that they honor living people. But I like that affirmation that, that it's, I'm a living <laughs> person that's receiving. Then I was like, oh yes, no, that's what it says. Living, oh, living people. Important. And I've actually known you for a few years now. We got to travel to the Holy Land of Israel together as well. And that was a real blessing. And as soon as I saw that tour come up, 
everything within me lit up like a Christmas tree and I knew that you were the only person in the world I would want to travel to that land with and it was beyond all of my expectations and your kindness to the group and the way you watched over us, the flock, and the wisdom that you imparted. It was incredible and so for everyone out there, as soon as we're able to travel again, if you can travel to ancient sites with Greg, I highly recommend it. It's life-changing. And then we also got to work together in New Mexico, which was fantastic. Yeah. Really, really wonderful. So, yes, let's get back to the uh, times of extremes. I just wanted to take that moment just to explain <laughs> a few things to people. But can I ask you back to the time of extremes, what is it that we can expect right now and how, how can we make life easier in these times? Sure. Well, thank you for for the introduction and for the uh, the the review of of my life. It's always interesting to hear someone else read <laughs> yeah. read uh, your life accomplishments. So, uh, and I'm yeah, not finished right. yet. So, so I have to say, someone wanted to do a life achievement award for me, and I said, "You cannot do that because I'm not finished yet. You can't give me my <laughs> lifetime achievement. It's still happening." <laughs> yeah, so that's right. what I'd like to it's do. Uh, what I'd like to do, so uh, Rob, if you would please bring up our first slide, please. Uh, I want to talk about cycles, cycles of time. What we now know as is, is, is scientists is that we are living a rare convergence. We in the world right now, we are living a rare convergence of multiple nested cycles, natural rhythms that change the way that we think, they change the way that we live. And the three primary rhythms that are, are driving the changes in the world right now, I'm gonna mention them briefly, uh, and then I'll tell you where you can, uh, you can see more information about this at, at no charge. Uh, but the first one, Rob, if we could, could bring up the uh, slide number two, please, I appreciate it. Uh, the first of these is climate. Now, we all know that climate is changing. As a geologist, I want to be very clear on where I, am, uh, where I am personally on this. Climate change is a fact. That's the whole point. It is a fact, and we need to change the way we think and live so that the climate change has less of an impact on our lives. It's clinging to an old way of thinking and living in the presence of a cycle that no longer supports that way of thinking and living. That's where the problem comes from. That's where the suffering comes from. So what I'd like for you to see on the screen right now, uh, these are charts taken from the ice cores, and these particular ice cores were uh, in Antarctica. Uh, some of you are familiar with ice cores, some are not. The, the gift of an ice core is that when the scientists drill down through hundreds and thousands of layers of ice that has been deposited year after year after year, each layer of ice contains information about what was happening to Earth on that year. So we can learn about things like how strong the sun was, how warm the temperatures were, how cool the temperatures were, how high the sea level was, what the magnetic fields of the Earth were doing, all of that and more we can learn from, from the ice cores. So what you're looking at on the screen are two primary ice cores. On top is blue, uh, and the, the one below that is green. The one on blue, it's called the EPICA ice core. The one below is called Vostok, very famous locations uh, in Antarctica. So what I'd like to call your attention to, on the left-hand side of the screen is present day. On the right-hand side of the screen, the you can see that the, the data goes back over 400,000 years before today. It's called BP, before present. So we're looking at a continuous record of the warming and the cooling. This is what we're seeing on these ice cores for over 400,000 years. And what you see is there is obviously a rhythm of warming and cooling, warming and cooling. Uh, it's been happening for a long time. Right at the 200,000 year mark, you also see a blue vertical line. That line I put there because this is when anatomically modern humans emerged on Earth. We mysteriously appeared on Earth. I've written books about it. We do workshops uh, about our origin and what the, the DNA science is telling us. But the point is that we appeared 200,000 years ago 
And these cycles were happening at least 200,000 years before humans appeared on Earth. What that tells us is that humans are not the cause of climate change. I know that is, uh, is an unpopular message in, in some circles. Uh, it is also based upon the evidence. This is what the evidence shows. Humans did not cause the climate change. Humans have definitely contributed to the climate change. Since we didn't cause it, it's very unlikely that we can stop it. And for that reason, it makes tremendous sense to adapt to it. I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. So where are we right now? If you look to the left, there's a blue arrow uh, that says 2020. We are right there where that arrow is pointing. We are in what the chart says should be a warming cycle. And according to the rhythms, we should be in a, a, a warming cycle. If you look at the warming in the past, what we're experiencing now is nothing compared to what was happening in the past. When you look at, at, at the temperatures, uh, let's see, in, in 100,000, a little over 100,000 years ago, you can see it was much warmer than it is right now. Uh, it's what happens after the warming. Typically, that's the problem. It's the cooling, and we are now in a cooling phase. A lot of controversy about this. I'm going to talk about in just, just a moment. So I want you to see that this in and of itself would change the way we think and live, because when the climate changes, it changes the weather. And when the weather changes, it changes when it's hot, when it's cold, when the seasons begin, when the seasons end, when it rains, when it snows. That determines when we grow our food, how we grow our food. It determines where people live and how people live as populations migrate, all being directed through this climate cycle. So as a geologist, I, I could spend our whole 90 minutes talking, and I would love to. So I, I want you to know everything I'm going to say right now, if you go, don't do it now, but when you get a chance, go to YouTube. Uh, the Gaia organization, the Gaia film organization, I've done a series with them called Missing Links. Episode one of season one at absolutely no charge is available uh, on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, Greg Braden, uh, uh, Missing Link season one, and you will see uh, more information about what I'm talking about right now and some things I can't show you right now. So, so that you can have, have more of that information. If this were all that were happening, it would be a big deal. It's not. Can we have the second? I'm sorry, the third slide, please. The next slide. We are also living the convergence of an economic cycle. Uh, those of you who studied economy know of a man named Kondratiev. This is a Kondratiev cycle, and what you can see on your screen is that he broke economic cycles down into seasons according to nature. I love this. So there is a spring and a fall and a winter and a summer in terms of economic cycles. Each season has its characteristics where some things hold value and some things lose value, where interest rates climb or interest rates decline, where inflation is high or inflation is low. We now are in the spring of a new economic cycle. If you look at the lower left-hand part of your screen, you can see this. It is a, a very unsettling time because assets that we used to think held value are losing their value, paper assets like stocks in companies, for example, and the tangible assets like land, like water, like food, like metals. These are the things that begin to hold their value better in the spring of an economic cycle. Also in that YouTube video, I talk about this so you can see more about that. So here's the point. Not only are we live, living the, the, the climate change that's happening, now an economic change is happening at the same time and both of these are linked. Uh, Rob, can we please have the next slide up, please? They are linked to a cycle that a lot of people have never heard about. It is called the conflict cycle. Now, when, uh, I was speaking to the United Nations with my, my dear friend, my spiritual brother, my colleague, Dr. Bruce Lipton. We were invited to speak at the UN together as a team. And we shared uh, the science that shows that cooperation is the fundamental rule of nature, not competition. And when we talked about conflict cycles, they were surprised because the thinking is that conflict just happens when it happens. There is a correlation between conflict and natural rhythms and natural cycles. I'm going to just do it at a very high level. <clears throat> the heart and the brain, human heart and human brain are the strongest magnetic biological uh, biomagnetic generators in the human body. The heart is much stronger than the brain. All right. When the magnetic fields of our Earth are in flux, they influence the magnetic fields of the heart. 
And the net effect is that when the magnetic fields are strong, we are more cooperative, uh, less aggressive, more willing to work together to solve our problems. When the magnetic fields are weak, it's the opposite of all that. We are vulnerable to conflict. What you see in this chart is if you look at the tops and the bottoms of these rhythms, they are directly linked to the solar cycles of our sun where the magnetic fields ebb and flow, influencing the magnetic fields of the earth that ebb and flow, influencing human consciousness and our willingness to either cooperate or solve our problems through conflict. And you're seeing this very clearly in this, this particular rhythm. Yeah, I could do other, other wars and you could see the same thing. Now, I wanna be very clear. We are not slaves to this cycle. We always have choice. We can always choose. And the beauty of what you're seeing is not only, not only are we vulnerable to conflict, but if you look at this closely, you will see that we are now in the greatest opportunity for peace that we will have or have had for a very long time because the beginnings and the endings of the great wars in the past happened at the tops and the bottoms of those cycles. Where are we right now? If you look at that blue arrow, right there is the year 2020 on the top of that red hump that you're seeing right there. 2020 is a period of the lowest magnetic fields measurements, magnetic measurements for our planet. It is coinciding with the solar cycles. We are, the sun is right now. We're at the end of solar cycle 24. We have yet begun solar cycle 25. Activity is little or I know that my uh, my connection was just dragging, so I paused just for a moment. What it means is that the magnetic fields on the sun are are either nil or they're very, very weak. That is influencing what's happening here on our planet. And there are a lot of scientific correlations between solar cycles and human coherence, social coherence. OK, so I want to be very clear about this. We are not slaves. We are now at a place. If you know where you are in the cycle, it is the opportunity, the opportunity to become a good listener, to extend the olive branch of peace, to give another the benefit of a doubt. This is true between nations. It's true between members of our society. It's true between anyone experiencing conflict. It's true with members of your own family, your husbands, your wives, your partners, your spouse, your kids, your siblings, your coworkers. Humans are influenced by these fields. So I know I'm speaking quickly because I want to get to the resilience of what we're talking about here, but I'm laying the foundation. This is no ordinary time in the history of our planet. Each of these cycles in and of themselves could create tremendous change. All three of them are converging right now. And you and I are witness to what is happening that we have not seen over 5,000 years of recorded human history. So if you're wondering what's happening, why do things seem so different now? This is, this is the underlying cause at a, at a high level. We are the, uh, experiencing the result of three natural rhythms that are converging in a way that we've never seen, again, in 5,000 years, creating the chaos. And the chaos is what happens when you try to think and live in ways that do not reflect what the cycles are presenting in your life. And once you begin to see this, it makes perfect sense of what we need to do next. So I'm gonna stop with the explanation right there, Chinsi, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you, uh, I'm gonna ask you first, did that make sense? And second, um, do you have any questions that I didn't cover you think that maybe our, our listeners might want to know more about regarding those cycles? Right. And then we're gonna get on to the resilience. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, that graph is just so helpful. And I, I was wondering if you could speak just briefly about, you'll talk about the field and how we're actually a part of the field as opposed to yeah. being separate from it. So therefore it makes sense when you look at that graph that we are feeling within our lives and within our own you know, body systems, the intelligence of ourselves, we can really feel yeah. that uh, the electric, electrical, the magnetic energy shifting and changing, and that can feel uncomfortable. So would that make sense as to why it's like as within, so without, as above, so below? And 
and that could be why we're, we're feeling so many shifts in our own lives right now. Absolutely, Chensia, because this is why I said what I said earlier. Our science has conditioned us to believe that we're separate from these influences and these effects. We document them, you know, we watch them through telescopes and we say, oh, isn't that interesting? What they're now beginning to understand is that we cannot separate our everyday experience from what's happening in the environment around us. So now we're talking about the physical environment, the environment, the magnetic fields primarily of, of the sun influencing the earth uh, and that in turn influencing the, through the neurons of the human heart, the way that we feel about ourselves. And what it does is it becomes very unsettling uh, because old ideas and belief systems that worked in the system that we had before, because that system no longer exists, those ideas and beliefs are looking for new equilibrium. They're looking for a new harmony. Doesn't mean they're right, wrong, good or bad. I'm not judging it here. It means that we are in the process of not seeking balance. It's not balance that we want, it's harmony. I'm gonna make this distinction because in balance, in ba nature doesn't like balance. In balance, nothing happens. If something is in perfect balance, nothing is happening. That's boring. Nature abhors balance. Nature wants harmony. So uh, I live in a rural area and we, our population of coyotes to rabbits is never in balance but it always is in harmony. As more rabbits come available be, in, in a given season, all of a sudden we see more coyotes to, to keep that population in check. So nature's looking for harmony. You and I and all of, my, all of my family viewing this, we are all seeking harmony in our lives in the presence of a system that is inharmonious right now because it's going through this change this is the external physical environment. And this is the first thing that I wanna to talk to you about when it comes to resilience. And then we're gonna move very quickly to the internal environment and finding resilience from our inner environment. So, uh, so Chancy, before I do that, I just wanna honor your question. Does, does that uh, help? Does that make sense? What I just said about, did I miss anything uh, about the No, the, most the definitely. And, I, and that was really great. It was sort of leading into the next thing I was going to ask, which is from mm -hmm. what I'm hearing uh, at, at the moment, there's going to be constant change. And so how can we adapt in healthy ways? What, what tools and techniques yeah. can we do? Is this where the resilience training comes in? This is what's so important, and I, I'm just going to look right in the camera to my global brothers and sisters, to my global family. I love every one of you. I love you for living in this time, for all that you're doing to be the best version of yourselves, to create the best version of the world that's possible, and we're all in this together. That's why I wanted to share this today. So I'm going to begin a conversation that has been uncomfortable in the past when I've offered it, um, and there's a reason for that. When you know that the system is changing and you do not know where the system is going, it makes sense to be prepared. There is, uh, in psychology, there is a phenomenon that is called normalcy bias. Some of you are familiar with this. Normalcy bias is where we as individuals have a tendency to average out all of the big changes in life, it's hard for us to embrace those changes. And when the changes are so big that they, they appear frightening, it's hard for us. So we, dis, we, we tend to discount them. And because of that, we, we try to live our lives as if those changes are not happening. Um, there are all kinds of examples in history of normalcy, normalcy bias. When, when communities on a coastal town know that a massive hurricane is, is coming their way, all right, and there are people that will discount that. They'll say, you know, we've written it out before, we're gonna write it out again. Even though the National Weather Service is telling them this one's different, this one is different. It's stronger, it's faster. The ocean currents are warmer. And normalcy bias will say, you know, it's, it's not gonna be that big a deal. And, and those are the people who've been hurt or been killed. Uh, we saw this happen in Katrina, for example. This was a, a very sad example. So the normalcy bias in the past now, I'm going to talk about resilience. Resilience comes on different levels. It means different things to different people. Resilience happens in our physical environment. That's one form of resilience I'm going to talk to you about right now. It happens in our inner environment. 
that is mental, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and physiological. And I'm going to talk to you about that next. I'm going to do the physical environment quickly because there's so many other resources. I don't want to use our time to do this. But what I want to say is this. You've seen from this graph, you've seen from the chart, systems are converging. It makes sense to expect the unexpected. It makes sense to embrace the fact that this is not the ordinary time. This is no ordinary time in, in human history. It makes sense to expect extremes. And if we allow that deep truth to be present in our lives, it makes sense to prepare for those extremes because the extremes are only a problem when we're not prepared. The big storms, the ice storms that happened every year in the American uh, Northeast and the New England, they break power lines, people without power, they close roads, trucks can't get through to deliver food to, to major metropolitan areas, sometimes for weeks at a time, medical services aren't available, and people act surprised. And what we hear from the, uh, some of the scientists who are dealing with this, they say, well, this is, this is a storm that only happened once every 50 years, so don't worry about it. Then the next year, the same storm happens again. And the next year again, you get three 50-year storms within the period of three years. This is happening in the American desert Southwest. We had a 100 year rain a couple of summers ago here in the high desert of northern New Mexico. It washed out roads, it washed out riverbeds. I mean, it was a mess. They said, don't worry, it's a 100 year storm. It won't happen again for another 100 years. The next year, the same thing happened. It makes sense to expect the unexpected. So when we talk about resilience, physical resilience, it makes sense to prepare and when you're prepared, you are less stressed. And the last thing you want is to be stressed in a time of extremes, because the stress is what causes a drop in the immune response. You are less healthy when you are stressed in these extremes. So for that reason, I'm having this conversation with you. We've not seen the last shutdown from the last pandemic. If you're following the news in the last couple of days, we probably haven't seen the last pandemic. There's a flu that is emerging from Asia. Whether you believe in that or not, whether whatever the source is, whatever that means to you, the fact is that we are living these experiences and we probably haven't seen the last of them. As a scientist, I can tell you we have not seen the last extreme snowstorm. We haven't seen the last bad hurricane. We have not seen the last big rainfall. And for all of these reasons, it makes sense to be prepared in your home so that you're not caught off guard, so that you can be responsible for yourself and for your family. So what I wanna to say to you right now, to make this very easy, everyone has a different level of tolerance when it comes to, to what you can and can't do without. In times of extremes, sometimes we don't have food, sometimes we don't have electricity, sometimes we don't have medical supplies, uh, sometimes we don't have water. And it's up to you, you and your family, you have to, to make a determination, what is your tolerance for what you can and, and, and cannot live without? But what I've done, and uh, just take a note, and we'll put this in the chat on, on Facebook. If you go to my website, there is a, a tab that is called uh, Truth and Fiction. There's a little tab called Truth and Fiction. Uh, and if you click on that, additional resources, is a button that comes up and resource number 12 and 13, I've put up there for you today and it's yours. What number 12 is, is a list of, um, of reliable sources for the kinds of things we're talking about. If you want backup solar electricity in your house, inexpensively, I've got some references. More expensively, I've got other references. If you want food that can be stored for long periods of time, uh, that is healthy food. The last thing you want is to eat bad food in a time of extremes. That's when you need your strength. These are vegetarian. Uh, typically, you can add meat products if you would like. They'll stay on the shelf 25 years. Very easy. If you don't want to go out and, and build your own, it's a one-stop shop. Very reasonable. I've got given you that, that resource as well. Water storage. I've given you uh, a way to these very cool 13-gallon blue bricks is what they're called, that are stackable, where you can store water in times of need. Uh, and it's, it's one of the most vital resources that you'll ever have. Uh, uh, number 13 on that list, if you click on that, it's a very cool little food calculator 
where I've itemized the kinds of food that, that you can probably use. And I think it's for a family of four uh, for, for uh, 30 days. You can adjust it for whatever you need. Uh, and you put down what you have and it'll tell you what you need. And then you've got a shopping list so you know what to do. So again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but what I wanna say is physical resilience is based upon a principle that is called the principle of spare capacity. This is a fundamental principle in any kind of resilience. So for your physical environment, the first principle of resilience is spare capacity. And when you're talking about your physical environment, those are all the necessities, electricity, food, uh, water, medicine. There's a place to get medical kits on that list as well. So it's, I've been criticized for this because people say, Greg, you're, you're fear-based. From my perspective, I am a realist. I'm an optimist and I'm also a realist. I'm optimistic, we're, we're all going to get through this and we're going to have a better world because of it. But we are the generation living it. That's my optimism. My realism says, hey, when the environment changes, it makes sense to do what we need to do so that we are honoring what the environment is showing us. This is a kind of resilience, and I wanna to talk to you about this, and we're gonna go very quickly into the, the inner resilience. And Chensi, I know I'm, I'm going longer than we wanted here, but I wanna say this to our, our community. When we talk about resilience, the old way of thinking about resilience, traditional resilience is what it's called, is where we live our lives and then something happens that knocks us for a loop a loss, the end of a relationship, an earthquake, you know, a, a, a storm. And traditional resilience is our ability to bounce back from being knocked back, all right? It's the ability to, to bounce back to find some level of, of normalcy, all right? There's another kind of resilience. And uh, when we begin talking about this, this inner resilience. I know that you know, part, part of what I'm doing here, I do have a course, it's a six module course. It is based upon the new principle of resilience. It's called adaptive resilience, which is different than traditional resilience. Adaptive resilience is where you live your life and you think and you build the, the parameters to honestly reflect what it is that's happening in the world. So you do this all the time automatically. You do it intuitively. Perfect example, if the weather says, the weatherman says it's gonna to storm today, you might take a raincoat. That is adaptive resilience. It's not out of fear, it's just saying, hey, there's a chance of rain, I don't have to get wet if I don't want to. Adaptive resilience is where you make the changes that honestly and truthfully reflect the reality that you find yourself in. We are living a time of extremes. I just have to say that to you. It's not the time that we normally would expect. It is a brief period of, of extremes. The climate is going to continue to change. It's gonna cool. The economic changes are happening. We're now moving into this spring where tangible assets and commodities are, <clears throat> are gaining in value, where other things are losing value. The conflict cycle is happening where we have the greatest opportunity for peace as well as we are being most vulnerable to conflict. You're seeing that happen right now. So all of these things are, are happening simultaneously. Adaptive resilience is where you are prepared. And from my perspective, uh, I don't see that as fear. I see it as a responsibility to myself, to my loved ones, my family, and as my global family. That's why I'm sharing this with you in the way that I am now. So that's the physical environment. So before we go into the inner environment, Chinsy, I'm just gonna ask you to come back. We just covered a lot of ground and I know I'm speaking quickly to honor the time, but I, I want people to have the things that they need. Uh, and this physical resilience in our community, maybe you've seen this as well, in the new thought community and in the spiritual community, there is a, people really want to trust. And there's a deep trust. They say, I trust that I'll be taken care of. And, and often we are but often we are because we have honored ourselves in relation to the, the environment we find ourselves in. So how did that sound to you? Did it make sense? Does it sound, uh, sound like a fearful thing to you? No, not at all, because I think there okay. is that importance to be able to acknowledge what is and, and then look for tools and techniques that are going to be appropriate in the time, which is what you're speaking to us about today and 
it's that it, I, I totally understand when you say you're an optimist and a realist because we can't also ignore what is happening in the world, but we still want to be able to be like the phoenix rising through the, you know, out of the ashes and or the hero's journey with Joseph Campbell. You know, this is part of the journey of our soul and our spirit and being human is that we get a call to leave and then we have these trials that happen to us. It's, it's like, well, how, how do we step into that as opposed to uh, a run away from it and pretend that nothing's happening? How do we step up? And I, I feel that's what we're being asked to do right now is to step up globally yeah. and as individuals. And, yeah, I, I, I totally well, understand thank, what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that. You know, it's especially difficult because some people say, well, you know, these things are expensive. They can be. They don't have to be. On the list, I've given price ranges from top end to, to the bottom end. Not everyone. I know that the COVID-19 uh, has really hit the global community very hard. In the past, we've maybe hit one nation or another and other nations could step in to help. Our whole world is hurting right now. And when we are blessed with the opportunity to provide for ourselves and our families, we are often blessed with the opportunity to extend that even beyond our local family. And we can help other people when we have taken the steps to be able to help ourselves. Uh, it's very difficult to help other people if we are if we are having the, the difficulties as well. So that's where, where that's coming from. So for the physical resilience, there are a lot of really good resources out there. Uh, you know, and I know a lot of you have, have looked for these, but some people have said to me, I, I don't know where to begin, Greg. I don't even know where to begin. So my listener heard that. And what I've offered is if you go to these resources, they will give you a template. You don't have to do everything on there, but it's a place to begin. And then you modify and, and make it fit for your, your circumstances for your external physical environment. And you'll be glad that you did. Now, uh, and by the way, I also want to say I have no relationship with any of these companies. I don't have any, any benefit whatsoever other than knowing that you, my global family, uh, may be better positioned to care for yourselves. Many of these uh, resources I'm recommending because I've used myself. That's that's why I know the products are good. But I don't make any money on these. I don't want you to think I do. I'm just going to be really straight with you. And that's that's where it is. I want to move quickly into the inner resilience, though, because this is where I do want to spend some time. So can we can we is this a good time to talk about that? You think, Shensi, is can we? A hundred percent. And I'm, I'm hoping that you might have a technique you can share with us because you know that I do love to call on you to, <laughs> to guide us through something on yeah. the spot. So um, that would be amazing too if we can put that in the mix at some stage. I, so what I would like to do um, in the time that we have remaining, and I, and I do want to take a, a few questions and, and you know, yes. have some, some time to interact with our audience, but this is important. So just a quick review. We're talking about resilience. We're talking about external uh, environmental resilience. And I've given you some resources. I've shared with you what's causing the extremes. And from that, you can see that we're in this. It's not something that's going to go away probably within our lifetimes. We are living the emergence of whatever this new normal is. To the degree that we can adapt to this normal, adaptive resilience, to that degree, life becomes much easier. Now, I want you to think about this because there are a lot of people, if, if any of you are even watching mainstream news any longer, most, most people have stopped for good reason. But what so many people are doing is they're viewing this time of extremes as a little speed bump in the road of life. And they're saying, all we have to do is get over this speed bump and we're back on the main road and everything is cool. We can't go back to a world that no longer exists. And that is where the normalcy bias comes in. So we're in the change. We're not gonna go back to a time where there was no change. So we might as well learn to thrive. And this is it. We don't wanna just survive. We wanna thrive. We want to be the healthiest, most prosperous, the happiest beings that we can be. And that's all possible if we adapt to what the world is showing us, rather than trying to live what we're comfortable with in a world that no longer supports that. Such a powerful concept. So when we talk about now personal 
personal resilience. Personal resilience covers a lot of ground. It's more than I can do justice to in this quick 90 minute program. And for that reason, it's no secret, I have a course that I've developed. It's a six module course. Each module uh, is devoted to one particular topic. And I'm gonna go through those in just a moment. Uh, but it is all based upon adaptive resilience. This is from the Stockholm Resilience Institute. They are the pioneers in developing uh, principles of adaptive resilience. So when it comes to personal resilience, what does that mean? Well, you know, and I know that we are multidimensional beings. We have many dimensions, and I don't mean the higher dimensions you can't see. We have a physical dimension that needs to find resilience. We have an emotional dimension. We have a mental dimension. We have a spiritual dimension. We have a biophysical dimension. And all of those need to find their own kinds of resilience so that we in our entirety can be resilient from within to the changes that we're seeing in our outer world. So the physical resilience gives us what we need to live our lives and be at our best. And that's what I've just shared with you. The inner resilience is what this course is all about. It is dedicated in six modules to the psychophysical body and how to become resilient uh, in, in that body, the new discoveries of biology, of cell biology, new discoveries of stem cells. We're gonna go through the whole course with you here in just a moment. The mental, uh, the psychological, the emotional, uh, and the, the physical resilience that it takes to find our new harmony. Remember, we're not looking for balance, we're looking for harmony in the context of the world that we find ourselves in now. Now, uh, what I know is a lot of people are asking me about this course, that's why I wanted to combine that with everything else I'm, I'm talking about here. Some of you have already signed up for the course, some of you will never sign up for the course and I'll never see you again. And I want you to have something right now that you can use right now that will help you whether you take this course or not. We are all experiencing the stress of unresolved fear. We're being given reasons to fear 24 seven in the news cycles, friends, Facebook, uh, you know, I mean, if you're watching Twitter, if you're watching Instagram, a lot of you have stopped. One person says one thing, another person says something else that's completely counter, and you feel like you're ripped in a million directions. What's true, what's not? Well, how do you know what's true and how do you know what's not? All of that, all of that creates stress. And the stress that we are experiencing actually depletes our immune system of all times, man, of all the times to want a strong, healthy, powerful immune system. I can't think of a, a better time to have it than right now. And in the presence of the stress that we are undergoing, some of it is conscious, some of it's subconscious. And people are stressed in ways they don't know and their immune system is taking a hit. Now, what I wanna say to you just right off the bat about COVID-19 or the H1N1 that we are now being told is coming from Southeast Asia. It will be making its rounds again this year, another, uh, another round of flu, or any contagion that's out there. What I wanna say to you is this, we are made for times just like this. Our bodies know what to do with the contagion. We have been here, as you saw, 200,000 years, and for 200,000 years, our bodies have known what to do with these contagions because they are wired to thrive in these, in, within the presence of these contagions, but there's a catch, and here's the catch. The catch is you must love yourself enough, and I mean this, you must love yourself enough to give your body what it needs to be at its best so that it can do what it knows how to do in times like this. What does that mean? It means all the things you already know but maybe have taken for granted in the past. It means you've got, when you, when you put food into your body, don't just fill the space, give your body the highest forms of life-affirming nutrition that you know is possible in the moment that it's available, whatever that is in the moment. Sometimes it's not always, you know, if you're, if you're traveling 30,000 feet above the surface of the earth, sometimes a bag of nuts is the highest form of nutrition that I have, and I'm okay with that because I know that the next opportunity I have 
to honor my body with life affirming nutrition, I will give my body exactly that. My body knows that. All right. So honor yourself with life affirming nutrition, movement, exercise is so important. It stimulates the immune system as well as the hormones that help you to keep from becoming depressed. 